Good morning. Welcome. It's fantastic to see so many of you here today. Um, this course sold out in a matter of hours. Um, we were deeply surprised, which was um, probably our humbleness. But we, um, we are genuinely a collaborating centre at the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, and this uh, is part of that. So this is something about being independent and evidence-based, but also open and iterative. So please welcome to the conversation. Um, and as part of that, we've got the Wi-Fi in the, co in the conference center, so please use it. We have a, a, a Twitter hashtag for the event, which is WB Impact. Um, it'll be great to connect to you. One of the things that I love about these sorts of events is meeting people I've been talking to on Twitter in person. So please do be part of the conversation. By the end of today, you, um, we, are aiming that you would know how what you work on relates to well-being and that you all know about how to start about going how to do analysis and cost-effectiveness cost analysis in particular in your area. Um, we, so this is what I hope you're here for. <laughs> Policy tools, well-being impacts and value for money. They always ask you to do that at the beginning of the interviews. Um, I'm Nancy Hay, I'm the director at the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. We are an independent, collaborative organisation set up to develop and share the very best evidence that is robust, accessible and useful about wellbeing. Now we believe that wellbeing is the ultimate aim of government policy and most of the voluntary community sector action. And that we want a future that wellbeing increases year on year and that wellbeing inequalities particularly are reduced. We're part of the What Works Network, so we are robust. So one of the things I started the Local Government Association meeting last week with was happiness has a bit of an image problem. People think it's fluffy, and it's not. And that's what part of today is about putting some robustness behind it. And we use the same evidence standards as NICE do for um, clinical interventions, and that we have sister organizations across uh, a whole range of social policy areas. We work with a whole range of partners in government, research councils, and the National Lottery, as well as business and voluntary community sector. Um, so we're genuinely collaborating across sectors. We don't believe it's just government whose job it is to improve well-being of the nation. It's all of us. And we work with 15 universities across the UK, seven NGOs, and um, through Richard's team, the OECD, to really understand and bring together the best possible evidence about what we can actually do as organizations, as communities, and as individuals to improve well-being. Um, Richard's team is part of the cross-cutting team, and we'll be hearing a lot from them today about the work that they've been doing to improve cost-effectiveness around well-being. But we also have teams who look at work and adult learning, community well-being, and culture and sport and well-being. And some of those insights will be shared today by some of my colleagues. Um, this is what we'll be doing today. We will be doing, um, Richard Laird will be talking about why well-being and how to measure it. We'll then talk about what that means in terms of priorities for improving well-being with Andrew Clark. We'll have an opportunity for Q&A at that point, so please um, save up your questions. We really want to have it as part of a conversation. And then Sarah McLennan, uh, our head of evidence, will be talking about uh, what this means in practice and linking it to some of the wider uh, evidence that we're doing. There's another opportunity for lunch. Please use this as an opportunity to meet somebody you don't already know. That's part of the real benefit of this type of learning event. And then after lunch, we'll be hearing from Martin Knapp about economic evaluation. Um, Paul Freitas from some practical examples uh, and an interactive session. Uh, Martin Nat will talk about some other measures as well, and Ingrid will be talking um, about uh, tools and measures from the practice perspective. We'll then have a coffee break. We've got some breakout sessions on cost effectiveness or practical challenges. Please let us know if you're involved in one of those sessions. And then we'll talk a little bit about, we all believe that well-being is what we're trying to improve. But actually, that's not what everybody else is always focused on. So we'll be talking about how well-being affects other valued objectives across the range of areas. And Jan Emanuel Deneuve will talk about that. And then we have Lord Gus O'Donnell, with our patron of the centre, for the closing remarks. Now, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Richard Laird, who leads our cross-cutting strand and is also the patron for Action for Happiness, another partner in our organisation. <laughs> Well, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I don't know if you know the story about Michael Howard uh, when he was Home Secretary visiting a prison um, and realising he was going to have to speak to the prisoners and there were these murderers and rapists and people assembled in front of him. 
And as he stood up, he realized he couldn't say, uh, I'm delighted to be in such distinguished company. And he found himself saying, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> well, I think we're all very glad that you're here. Um, because, of course, it, it, I assume it demonstrates that you think well-being is a really important issue. Uh, and I think we would say it is the all-important uh, issue. Uh, and, in fact, it is the idea that is perhaps the most important idea of the modern age that brought us out of the, the era of superstition into an era of modernity. Uh, and this idea, of course, is that you would judge a society by the happiness of the people in this life, not the next. Uh, I think it's an incredibly powerful idea. Uh, and if you think it through as policymakers, what it means is that if you've got a given amount of money to spend, uh, you suspend it in the way that produces the most happiness per pound which you spend. It's just a very, very simple idea. So the aim of this uh, course or conference um, is to uh, enable people uh, in their analysis of policy uh, to uh, think about the outcome as being the change in the happiness of the population with which you're concerned. Uh, and to think about that in relation to uh, the cost. Uh, and I'm thinking that we need a workforce. This won't happen without really uh, competent people who have thought through how to do this. Um, you, I hope, are going to be some of them. Uh, I hope there are going to be some others watching this uh, on video. Uh, that's another important uh, group. Uh, so that we can build an army of people who can transform policy from a very haphazard kind of a, of a thing, where each department has got its own objective and nobody quite knows what the relations are between one objective and another, to one where we have an overarching objective and we think of all policy as contributing to that great, uh, noble and humane purpose which would uh, produce better policy and a better society. So, today, uh, as Nancy said, um, there are three main issues. First, how are we going to measure happiness? Uh, then what evidence uh, have we got uh, about what is going to improve happiness? Uh, and I'm going to uh, mention most naturalistic evidence and then experimental evidence. And of course, we need thousands of trials of whether policies make a difference to the happiness of the population that they're meant to be affecting. Uh, and then how we would evaluate uh, those interventions uh, in terms of their uh, value for money. Uh, and value for money means, just to labour the point, value for money means happiness <laughs> as the measure of value. Now, uh, as I said, this is not a new idea. It goes back to the 18th century. Uh, uh, I suppose that uh, 200 years ago, uh, most enlightened people would have thought like this. Uh, it's peculiar that we've actually gone back <coughs> in between. <laughs> um, this is Thomas Jefferson. Uh, very nicely put, um, and I think it would be worth asking, is there anything else that the government should be doing other than taking care of people's safety uh, and keeping them alive and the quality of their life uh, as they live it? I think the only thing I would add to this is that we are, of course, concerned with the distribution of happiness. It's not just the average. So social justice uh, is embedded in this idea, if you uh, extend this idea to include the distribution of happiness uh, and not just its average or total. Well, of course, the, the 18th and the 19th century didn't have uh, social science. <coughs> they didn't measure things. And it wasn't so easy to apply this. And then when, really, in the 20th century, we got into the era of mo mo everything had to be measured, socially, economically, uh, it was naturally a, a default outcome that uh, people seized on the GDP as the measure of national welfare. Uh, the great forerunners of the measurement of GDP, Kuznets, Keynes, and so on, was never intended to be a measure of welfare. Nobody even thought of it like that. They thought of it as a way of measuring the scale of economic activity because of its impact uh, on employment uh, and uh, living standards. 
and it wasn't meant to be a measure of welfare, but it became de facto a really very vulgar measure of welfare. And I'm quite sure none of none of you here in your jobs ever ever think of the impact of what you do uh, on the GDP as an adequate measure of what you're trying to achieve. Now, as time has gone on, uh, there has been increasing discontent with this idea that economic growth is going to bring the good life that we all want. Um, and this is partly just based on people, anecdotal people looking back, talking to their grandparents <laughs> and all of that, but it's, pa it's partly based on evidence. So uh, the longest run of numbers is for the United States, which goes back to the 1950s, and you can see that in spite of the very rapid growth, um, especially in the first half of the post-war period, um, there's been uh, no increase in the average happiness uh, of the population. Uh, here's a series for Britain, same story. Here's a story for West Germany, um, again. Now, uh, th there's been a lot of academic discussion uh, of this, and there are certainly countries in which happiness has grown. It's grown in Italy, it's grown in Denmark, for example. There are countries in which it's fallen, it's fallen in Belgium. Um, but what this crude evidence uh, challenges with is the fact that economic growth is, is simply no guarantee of increased happiness. I'm not saying it has no value, maybe it has a value and it's being offset by other things uh, that I could mention as I go along, um, but it's no guarantee. And it's certainly no adequate measure uh, of our national well-being. So I think there's been a, a popular disillusion uh, with growth, a feeling how can it be that we're so much richer than our parents and grandparents, and yet actually we still feel so stressed? <laughs> and uh, what's going on? Why aren't we, ha why aren't we happier if we're richer? Um, and politicians have tapped into this. I think the most far-sighted one, actually, is Angela Merkel, who has been having a national consultation on well-being, involving 100 meetings with ministers and the public and surveys uh, and so on. And I think this is a good restatement of what Thomas Jefferson said. The guideline for our policies should be what matters to people. And that's something we can learn about empirically. Uh, so the OECD has been a, a path breaker in this uh, and uh, has now, last year, uh, formally recommended to its member governments that they make well-being the goal of the government. Uh, the UN has shown some interest, passed a resolution that more attention should be given to happiness. It's allowed uh, the, the uh, publication of the World Happiness Report annually to be associated with the UN. Uh, that gets a, a million downloads a year, which shows the, the worldwide interest in these things. And now there's going to be a, a Global Happiness Policy Report, more focused on what we can do, uh, that will be presented at the World Government Summit each year. Uh, in, in Dubai, and Britain has been an important uh, pioneer in this. So we were the first country to measure well-being in a standard way as part of our national statistics uh, now for five years or so. Um, we were the first country to have a behavioural insights team which draws on the idea that humans are not just motivated by money. Uh, we have been doing more to improve the mental health services uh, than any other country. Um, which is based on a general feeling that actually how people feel <laughs> is something which we actually now take seriously. We don't only think the only things that matter are things that you can see and touch. But a person's inner state, uh, as the great 18th century idea said, uh, is the most fundamental thing for a person. Uh, and now we have the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, which I think is a hugely important development to uh, assemble the evidence and publicise it and help policymakers. Uh, to use it. Uh, as Nancy said, a lot of this has been driven uh, by Gus O'Donnell <laughs> uh, when he was Cabinet Secretary and uh, more recently. And I just want to draw your attention to a report which Gus chaired uh, because I think if you're looking for a Bible, you know, what, what do I read <laughs> if I want to uh, understand this way of thinking and apply it in my own job? Uh, I think that I, I would recommend starting with this report called, you may not be able to read it, it's called Wellbeing and Policy, uh, and you can find it on the, the Gartam Institute 
website. Uh, Gus was the chair. Uh, Angus Eaton, who got the Nobel Prize, was the one member. Um, the chief statistician of OECD, David Halpern from the Nudge Unit, and myself. So, uh, really, what I'm going to say now it, it, it covers the main issues <laughs> which that report covered. I'm going to cover them very briefly because they'll be covered in more detail later on, but just to give you a feel, an overview of what this is all about. So, the first issue is how to measure it. Second is what kind of evidence do we need about it, and then how would we use the evidence in cost-effectiveness an analysis. So we've had big debates in the What Works Centre, <laughs> and the What Works Centre has uh, uh, fortunately uh, endorsed the conclusion of this line of reasoning. So what would we want from a measure that we were using for policy analysis? Forget any other discussion. If we were a religious leader or something, what would we want? But as a policy uh, Analyst, what would be a, a, a good measure? Well, I would say there are three criterias, criteria. First is that you want to take just a simple question. Then everybody knows what the numbers relate to. Just one question. As soon as you have an index, you're into a, a world of abstraction. Nobody knows what on earth it is. It will never catch on. Uh, there has been, for about 50 years, uh, a movement of social, for social indicators and the quality of life that has produced indices, and I don't want to be impolite, but their effect has been small. <laughs> if you want to challenge a single number, GDP, you want another single number that everybody can understand. Um, and there are two problems with indices. One, nobody knows what they mean. Uh, but second, that you have to uh, apply the av when, you're, when you're weighting the different components, you have to apply weights which are the average weights for each of the members of the society. And of course, people differ in their weight. Some people, for some people, one thing is more important for others, another thing. Let's have a measure where the individual makes his or her own assessment of what their situation is in a way that's comprehensive, that summarizes the, the totality of their experience. Um, and thirdly, let's have a measure, of course, that policymakers feel comfortable with. Now, policymakers, as we know, are quite used to asking, are you satisfied with your health service or your local doctor um, or your police, etc.? So to ask people, are you satisfied with your life as a whole, that's just a natural extension, um, which would give policymakers a sense of what things are more important, uh, uh, or could do, what things are more important, uh, when we come to explain it by the different aspects uh, of policy and life. So that leads inexorably to the conclusion that we should be uh, using the measure of life satisfaction, that this is a, the question is overall, how satisfied are you with your life these days? Uh, naught to 10, naught, uh, extremely dissatisfied, 10, extremely satisfied. And I, I think if we plug on at this, we just hang on to a single concept. Uh, like we have a single concept of temperature, where well, we actually have two, which is a bit confusing. <laughs> But by and large, well, I, I've now discovered eventually, more or less, what centigrade feels like. Um, it's taken a while, and I, I'm absolutely sure in the 18th century nobody had any idea, probably most people, that temperature could even be measured. They thought it was this hot and cold, but I mean, what's the scale? Uh, we've got to get people used to the idea that there's a scale. It's not that you're very... In some of the discussions of happiness, it's absolutely ridiculous. People assume that you know, either you're happy or you're not. Of course not, it's a scale. We've got people fixed on that as a scale, and we know uh, and get used to what the different points on the scale are. Now, a problem is that many surveys don't include this measure, and um, the uh, What Works Centre, quite rightly, um, is very keen that we should have easier methods of converting uh, other measures into life satisfaction. Uh, you can find some conversion factors uh, in this uh, discussion. I see it's called discussion paper number one. <laughs> uh, of the What Works Centre. Uh, and a, a final comment on measurement. People say, but isn't happiness subjective? How, how can we uh, base our policy on something that's subjective? Well, of course, what is uh, subjective is incredibly real. <laughs> I mean, how you feel 
whether you're down or up, is an incredibly real thing. And in fact, it's a, a totally objective phenomenon that can be measured in all sorts of ways. And uh, the, the, the first point that I want to make, and this is what actually made me believe in this subject, is that these self-reports, whether people, how people are feeling, are quite well correlated with brain measurements, which are clearly objective. So we can uh, be content uh, in saying that these subjective experiences are objective phenomena that we can objectively measure. And then if we take these self-reports, it's amazing uh, what they can predict. They can predict longevity, job quitting, marital uh, breakup, childbearing, productivity and voting. And I'll just give you uh, two examples. This is extraordinary. Uh, this is from the Longitudinal Study of Aging. These are taking people at the beginning of the survey, asking them how happy they are, dividing them into three groups, and seeing what proportion of them die over the next nine years. <laughs> and you can see that the, the least happy third, uh, di uh, th three times as more of them died uh, as of the happiest third. Now that is a and not holding anything else constant analysis. If you put in, for example, the medical assessment uh, at the beginning uh, of the period, uh, th these differences small fall, but there's still uh, at least a difference of 50% between uh, the least happy third uh, and the happiest third. Um, but perhaps most important for you as uh, policymakers, most of you, or po related to policymakers, um, is whether this affects, whether uh, the politicians that you are serving uh, get re-elected. And Clinton said, uh, it's the economy stupid. Well, it's not the economy stupid. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, life satisfaction. Um, this is a, an equation that explains the outcomes of European elections since 1970 using the Eurobarometer surveys of life satisfaction. Uh, and of the and of obviously the data on the incumbent vote share regressed on these factors and the, the, the incumbent vote share at the previous election. Uh, so you'll see that, the, and these are partial correlation coefficients, so you can see that life satisfaction is doing more work uh, in explaining uh, the outcome of these elections uh, than any uh, of the uh, economic uh, variables. So it it's a, has a real predictive power. So I hope we've got to this point that, uh, like John Stuart Mill, we think that it's the happiness of the individual that is, should be the objective of policy uh, and we're going to measure it uh, by life satisfaction. Okay, so second, second issue. Um, what evidence do we need? And Andrew and others are going to give most of this, but I'll just give you a flavour. We obviously need some method of thinking about what policy areas to pay particular attention to when we do policy development. And which aspects of life matter most is an obvious guide. What proportion of the variance, the huge variance in happiness um, in the population, probably indeed in this room, um, and uh, what explains that? The things that explain it a lot are obviously things policymakers should be interested in. Um, but it's a quite different thing from designing a policy uh, and, and implementing a particular policy. There, we must have trials, and we must have thousands of trials of different interventions where we measure the outcome, the main outcome, uh, as life satisfaction. Um, so, uh, there's the actual, if you like, number one is a naturalistic study of how things are. Uh, now, and two is experimental study of how things could be if we change things. So let me just t t talk a bit about the naturalistic study of what matters, because we've got a book coming out on this that Andrew will be talking about. Um, there's the distribution of life satisfaction. What explains this spread? Um, well, that, those are some of the main factors. Income explains a bit, but... Um, you can, you can see that the partial correlation coefficient is 0.1, which means that it explains actually 1% only of the variance uh, of uh, life satisfaction in the population. The big factors are human relationships, um, 
whether you're partnered and physical and mental health. And mental health is the biggest single factor uh, in explaining uh, where you are on this, this curve. Uh, holding the other things constant. So this is not that part of mental health that could be explained by income or unemployment. This is the part of mental health that can't be explained by any of the other things in the equation. Uh, so these, this gives you an idea of where we should be looking for policy development. Um, we should be looking into you know, family support, uh, mental health, promotion and treatment and so on. Those should have much higher priority. Um, but of course, that is what we can do for adults, because this, this is an equation relating to uh, adult life satisfaction, to adult circumstances. But what if we said, what should we do for children to try and get them headed in the right direction? Um, we can obviously also do analysis like that. Here's that. Uh, what are the most important factors? Well, we've weighted this in favour of qualifications, because this is any qualification got up to the age of 20, 25 or more. And the other variables we put in are the child's behaviour at 16 and the emotional health of the child at 16. Um, and, and then, of course, parental variables. But you can see that what would make a bigger difference to adult life satisfaction is if we were doing a lot more about the emotional health of our children at, at 16. And the idea that uh, the only way to be a happy adult is to do well in your exams uh, is a, 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 it's just a fallacy, it's just not correct. So new goals for schools follow directly from that. Let me end up uh, on cost effectiveness analysis. So we've got some trials now, I haven't talked about those, but we need to have trials of all kinds of policies in these areas. And we've got a, a measure of how they're affecting the life satisfaction of the population uh, and a, a measure of their cost. <coughs> um, this is a quite different approach, obviously, from traditional cost effectiveness analysis, where the outcome we were looking at would be some measure of willingness to pay um, in ordinary cost benefit analysis. The benefit is measured by what people are willing to pay for it. But of course, if you think through what public expenditure is, <laughs> uh, the willingness to pay is just not relevant to most of the things that the government spends money on. It's not relevant to health, law and order, defence, welfare, pensions, uh, probably but certainly social services, aspects of the environment. Uh, that's why we can't have a coherent policy in these areas unless we can get some new overall criterion. And I think the impact on life satisfaction uh, is the one that we need. So, um, traditional cost effectiveness analysis can't be done in most of the areas, which is why, as we know, the, uh, the, it's not done. <laughs> and the impact assessments are done on a whole range of outcomes, um, not on any kind of, of, of uh, unified concept. Um, and uh, our argument is that we must have that unified concept. We should be measuring all outcomes in terms of uh, units of life satisfaction. So let's assume now that we've got a given pot of money, we're a central government or we're a, a local government or we're an NGO, we've got a certain pot of money, how do we spend it so as to have the biggest impact uh, on life satisfaction of a population uh, that we're serving? Uh, obvi obviously, uh, we have got to maximise across people the sum of the changes in life satisfaction uh, relative to the available cost which means that we would, we would take policies in order of the size of their impact on life satisfaction per dollar per pound spent. Uh, and that we would eventually find the money had run out, and that would give us the cutoff, um, which uh, would determine which policies we can afford and which ones we can't. And th this, of course, is extremely similar to how the quality system is, met, is, is working in in the health service. But here, we'd be talking not about uh, qualities, quality of life adjusted years. We'd be talking about uh, life point years of life satisfaction. Uh, let's just dwell on that for a second. 
uh, we, we spend some money now, and, and obviously we have to measure the benefits in terms of accumulated improvement and experience. So it's got, it depends not only how big the change is in, in each moment in the quality of experience, but how long it lasts. So the outcome is actually point years of life satisfaction. But we'll be coming back, back to that um, in the afternoon. Um, so where to start? Um, we've been asked this question, and I think it's a reasonable one. The, the health service um, roughly applies the rule that uh, you can only uh, justify a treatment uh, if the cost per quality is less than 25,000, or putting it the other way around, the change in quality per unit of cost is more than one over 25,000. Because our, the qualities are measured from 0 to 1, the life satisfaction is more measured from 0 to 10. Uh, this is a, a possible uh, sort of starting point. But of course, the ultimate test is, does it lead to you spending all the money? <laughs> if not, make the test less demanding. Or does it lead to you uh, to try and be spending more money than you have, in which case the, the, the cut-off has, has got to become more demanding? Right. Now, I, I just want to end with, with that distri distributional issue, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning. We might not be just interested in adding up life satisfaction across everybody. We might be more concerned um, with giving more weight to people who started off in a bad place. In fact, I think a lot of you here, I'm sure, are motivated by that. That's probably why you're doing your jobs. Um, and it, it's important to know whether the factors that affect people's well-being are pretty much the same across the whole spectrum, or whether it's different factors that really affect misery. Interestingly, it isn't. <laughs> uh, th this is an analysis uh, where the first column is the one I already showed you, but the second column um, has, uh, as the thing to be explained, simply whether somebody is, has a very low level of life satisfaction or not. And you can see that the partial correlation coefficients to explain that outcome uh, are essentially the same as the ones explaining the whole uh, distribution of outcomes. So um, that's, 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 that's of interest, but you might still say uh, we, we just want to focus on a policy which will lift people out of that bottom level of, uh, of life satisfaction. Uh, so. Here, here is a rather uh, back-of-the-envelope calculation just to provoke your thoughts, and I'll leave you with this. <laughs> um, to move one person out of misery, we could imagine different areas where we could uh, introduce policies. And you can see that treating more people for mental health is going to have a far bigger effect per pound spent than any of those other policies. Uh, unemployment policy is also a very important active labour market policy. Healthcare is, is important. And what all of this brings home to me is the wrongness of the education that I had uh, in Economics 101, <laughs> which basically said uh, you should redistribute income in kind. The way to deal with, with, with disadvantage is, is give people money. Uh, I think that is now uh, very much in question uh, in, in terms of the things which aff really, really affect how people feel uh, and the quality of their lives. But that perhaps is too controversial to note to end on. Let me just summarise. <laughs> um, we want to use life satisfaction, include it in every survey. Uh, we can explain it to a large extent, and we should do policies uh, that are uh, cost uh, effective. I think this is a hugely important opportunity we have to develop a more rational and coherent approach to policy because there's some overall concept that is defining what we're trying to do and we're measuring the value for money of everything in terms of how far it contributes 
uh, to that outcome, uh, and I, I hope that that outcome would be a happier society. But uh, Nancy mentioned Action for Happiness, uh, which we founded five years ago. <coughs> it's a movement for, for personal change to uh, try to create more happiness in the world. But when we interviewed uh, the candidates for the director, one of them had gone into the web to see if there was any other organisation uh, in the web uh, that had the word happiness in the title. This is five, six years ago. Uh, and the answer came back on his screen was, your search for happiness has produced no results. <laughs> well, I like to think that that has already changed, but with your help, it will change a lot more. Thank you very much. <coughs> for my slides to come up, actually. Huh. Ha. Okay, thank you. So this is um, quite an unusual day for me. Um, this is the first time I have ever taken part on, in a course on well-being policy. So th this, this is new. And it's the first time I've ever followed Richard Layard uh, in a talk where he's finished on time. So uh, it's quite striking. I, I usually get about five minutes for my bit. So I'm very happy about that. It won't happen again, I know. OK. So I'm going to talk to you about what we know um, in terms of numbers. As you've heard from Richard, uh, the What Works Centre for Wellbeing um, and, and the group here at the LSE takes uh, well-being extremely seriously. I'm happy to report that academic economics now uh, does so as well. And as we know, the proof of that is publication. And the proof of the impact of publication is citation. And I've just given you a couple of statistics about citations in two of our top-ranked economic journals where you can see that well-being contributions, which were a very, very small percentage of the papers uh, published in these journals, are in fact amongst the best cited, so that, that's a nice thing. So the question now is, <laughs> academics believe in it, um, the What Works Centre believes in it, of course, um, what about policymakers? Should you believe in it? And what can we say to help convince you uh, about the things that can be done to change the level of adult well-being? Here it's be adult life satisfaction. So I'm on a mission impossible. I've got to summarise the, some of the work we've been doing in the past three or four years at the LSE in 30 minutes. So let me try to, uh, 30 minutes or less. So let me try to do that. Um, my job here is then going to be to bring some empirical grist to this mill of uh, policy evaluation using well-being. And that's going to be based on the uh, statistical analysis of large scale data sets to shed light on the well-being benefits of potential policy evaluations. Of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of policy evaluations. I'm only going to talk about one or two. So I'm going to use this life course perspective through the talk where um, our objective is adult happiness. But notice that I've split that up into my happiness and the happiness of everybody else. What's going to happen here is that many interventions on me, making me richer, making me more educated, making me healthier, will affect my well-being, but will potentially affect the well-being of others around me as well. And this is going to end up being a rather essential part 
of the work we've done. So the first uh, part is looking at contemporaneous adult outcomes, um, and that's a very fancy way of saying, what can we do to treat adults now that might affect their well-being now? Uh, so contemporaneous in that sense. What could we um, intervene on? And to do this, to evaluate this, we're going to be looking at uh, two sets, uh, sets of data in the uh, UK. Uh, the first is a birth cohort. So um, the British cohort study, uh, this is following over their entire life a cohort of individuals born in 1970. So they're all the same age, which is good and bad. Uh, and the second is the British Household Panel Study, where we follow uh, adults of all adult ages over a, a period of around 25 years now. Okay, so this is going to be using UK data uh, mostly, though we are engaged uh, with uh, the LSE and the OECD to um, try to reproduce some of this work in other countries. Okay, so this is an illustration of the kind of numbers that we get out from this analysis of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, observations on individuals. What we're trying to model here is the life satisfaction that individuals like you and me report when they're interviewed. How satisfied are you on a 0 to 10 scale? You're going to give me a number. I'm going to relate that to what I know about your circumstances. So the kinds of benefits that we model here are a doubling of income gets you about 0.1 of a point on life satisfaction. Okay, so you go up from being 7 to 7.1. Well, except you can't because it's an integer scale. But what it means is for 10 people on seven, one of them goes up to eight, essentially. That's, that's, that's what we're modelling here. So that's, it's not zero. It's not particularly big either. And we're going to see during the course of this, and Richard's already alluded to this, that income is actually not a terribly efficient way of uh, buying life satisfaction on average. Uh, an extra year of education gets you 0.03, and that looks even worse. I mean, 0.03, how big is that? Not very big at all, except that you get it through your entire life. So let's just bear that in mind. If I double your income, I need to double it every year, so it's costly. If I educate you, you're educated through your entire life. Okay, so it's 0.03 times the number of years which you benefit from that higher education. So we should always have this life course um, idea in mind. A much bigger coefficient is unemployment, and this has been one of the, um, one of the topics that we've looked at a lot here, um, partly because as economists we believe it's exogenous, it's not chosen, so it's something that we can easily evaluate in terms of its well-being impact. That well-being impact is large. It's 0.7, um, that's two-thirds of a life satisfaction point. Um, for those of you who are very excited about uh, statistics, and I know we all are, uh, that's about 40% um, of a standard deviation. I mean, th this is a big effect. It's a big effect, and uh, it's something that we should worry about. And lastly, something that we, we never really talk about, or we talk about much less than we should, uh, the world of work is not just I'm working, I'm not working. It's also, I'm working and I really love this job because I'm engaged with it and I don't feel tired at the end of the day and it's a good salary and I really like it, all the way to I really hate this job um, for various health and insecurity and engagement and personal relationship reasons. And the quality of work within those people who are working is also attracts an extremely large coefficient. And this is something I think we should probably spend a little bit more time on than we do. So I'm not going to run through all of these. These are just illustrations of the kinds of things we could think about changing. The first um, was about the world of work, if you like. The second is uh, about more social kind of parameters, where you can see that these are picking up really quite large effect sizes um, separation having an effect on well-being that is as large as unemployment. 
And these are, these are big effects. You can see a large effect from uh, widowhood as well, and especially uh, following on from what Richard said, a large effect of depression or anxiety of uh, 0.7, uh, bringing life satisfaction down. So these are multiple regression analyses, um, and I'm sure you're all relieved to hear that. Um, that means that we're modelling everything at the same time. They're not just a correlation of A with B, they're a correlation of A with B and C and D and E and F and so on. So these are, these are partial effects of changing something, holding everything else constant, and that's of course what we need to do, uh, because that's what policy does. It changes one thing and holds everything else constant. Right, so far so good. So some of you may be used to seeing regression uh, results where you've got a set of coefficients, and that's what I've just shown you. Um, but what I didn't mention is what's going on in the second column of this table. What's that all about? And this is the spillover effect of a policy that affects me on you, that we're estimating. Some policies that affect me won't affect you at all, in which case we only need to look at the first column, and that's what we think about job quality, for example. Others can affect me and you at the same time, and there we talk about spillovers between me and you, or more formally externalities uh, between me and you. And one of the lessons I think we've learnt in this book is that empirically the effect of policy on other people is as important as the effect of policy on the people to whom it is targeted. Now, um, if I can just go back to that actually, you can see from our estimations here, we have a rather depressing story. Income works in the sense I give it to you, you get happier. I actually need to give you quite a lot of income to make a substantial effect on your life satisfaction. But the income I give to you makes those around you less happy. And our estimate is that the positive effect on you is exactly cancelled out by the effect on others around you. So it's as if we're engaged in a rat race or a status game with each other and changing income, we suggest on average, will have little effect on um, aggregate well-being because the people who benefit um, are going to be exactly cancelled out by the people who uh, are harmed by having a relatively lower income. Okay, so this is well illustrated by the Easterlin paradox that some of you may know about. The paradox is that richer individuals are happier than poorer individuals, so that seems like income's a good thing. And then when everyone gets richer, not much happens at all. So that seems to suggest that income's a bad thing. Um, so these are, uh, Richard stole my thunder on this one, as usual. Um, so he, he actually showed you some of these. In many countries, we can find no trend in life satisfaction as GDP per capita, in real terms, grows very substantially. And the way to perhaps understand that is that richer people are ha happier than poorer people because exactly they are richer than them, so it's a rank or status effect, but as everyone becomes richer, nobody becomes relatively richer. So we're all in the same status rank we were to start with. At the microeconometric level, when we look at individuals, that's exactly what we find. My income is associated with a higher life satisfaction, but the income of others systematically reduces my life satisfaction. This holds in uh, the large-scale data sets we've looked at in the UK, in Germany, Australia, and the USA. So in this sense, income is actually a pretty blunt, a pretty useless policy tool, actually. It does work if we t consider it in partial equilibrium, though it's not that powerful, but it doesn't work at all, according to these numbers, 
in general equilibrium. What's good for you is bad for other people. Okay. Unfortunately, and <laughs> this is one of those occasions where the numbers didn't play out according to what we thought we were going to find or what we, in some sense, would have liked to have found, we find the same effects for education. Education is good for you. It doesn't necessarily uh, seem to increase societal well-being in that uh, others' education is negatively correlated with your own well-being. So some adult outcomes don't work in this way. For income, the more you get, the happier you are, the less happy I am, and we suggest that cancels out. Other kind of interventions we could think of actually reinforce each other. So this is the case for unemployment, where my unemployment is associated with lower well-being for me, but it's also associated with lower well-being for you. Nobody likes unemployment, the people who are unemployed nor the people who are around the unemployed. A ditto uh, criminality uh, has a negative uh, association with both the individual and the uh, society around that, uh, that, that crime, as it were. Well, on the other side of the coin, partnership is positive, both for the people experiencing it and for, um, uh, and for those around them. So that's, these are mostly results from the BHPS. Uh, if we move to the British Cohort Survey uh, study, we find exactly the same kind of numbers. Again, Richard has showed you some of these. Here, um, well, here they are again. Uh, the advantage of doing this, for those of you, again, who are statistically minded, is the British Cohort Study follows people from pre-birth. That means I can look at the effect of their adult outcomes on their adult life satisfaction, conditioning on the kind of kid they were at 16, the kind of kid they were at 10, the kind of kid they were at 5, and indeed the kind of parents they had during their childhood and even pre-birth. What that means is I can be sure that changing the adult outcome is, is <laughs> holding constant all those pre-existing characteristics of childhood and of the family. And it turns out that the results are exactly the same in the BHPS and the BCS. And uh, you, you may be quite indifferent to this. Um, I'm, I'm actually not. This is hugely important to show this equivalence. It means that policy can work on adults. And that's one of the big questions in this literature is, are we all fixed by age five? Is everything done by age 10? Or is there potential to intervene in adult ages. And these kinds of numbers are showing you exactly that we can intervene at adults, even given their varied childhood and family experiences, and make a substantial difference to their life satisfaction. Okay. So, um, the second part of this talk is about past adult outcomes. In other words, what happens to interventions over time? Let's say we do something, we uh, make someone unemployed or we make someone in good health or we make someone uh, uh, partnered or what have you. What happens over time? Do they continue to be happy and unhappy or do they get used to uh, their new status? In which case policy interventions are good but not for very long. So it's key to know this. And here are three countries for which we have long-run panel data where we can follow the same individuals as things happen to them and follow their life satisfaction as they adjust or not to that event. Um, here's the first one, uh, perhaps the most surprising one. Do we get used to children? We all know children are a source of joy and happiness in our life, right? Except they're not, really. Um, I can... I mean, mine aren't. I don't know about yours. Um, but you can see this in, in averages across the Britain, Germany, and Australia. Having children is a good idea for up to around 12 months. Uh, in fact, the best time of your life is thinking about having children. This is a, so I, I'm not sure we can push this as a policy intervention. Talk about that one later. Um, but you get used to your children fairly quickly, and by the age they're two, you're no happier 
uh, than you were uh, without, when you were uh, childless. So this quick adaptation to children. Separation is something of the same lines, a very large effect size. As you can see, it's a big drop on separation. You're going down by one point or more. This is a large effect. But then a bouncing back that takes time and doesn't always get you back to where you started. So partial and long adaptation to separation. Something of the same um, effects for widowhood. These are uh, uh, situations to which you do adapt, but it takes some time. On the contrary, no adaptation to unemployment. And I, I think I believe this now. Unemployment, you go down, you stay down. So if you become unemployed, the first year of that unemployment spell is just as painful as the fourth year of the unemployment spell. You don't get used to it. It doesn't get better in that sense. And these are what the psychologists call within-subject analysis. So I don't have a composition effect. This is the same person followed from year to year to year through their uh, unemployment spell. OK. We don't adapt to partnership. Partnership is good and stays good. As you can see here, this is people coming into their partnership. You can see a nice courtship effect here in the years before um, partnership. But you do go up and you stay up, pretty much. Well, unless you're a German woman. That's, that's something we haven't quite figured out yet. <laughs> you're taking notes here, Nancy. Um, Right, so you don't adapt to um, partnership and marriage. Well, marriage you, you do adapt to, but marriage is a temporary blip in a long-term positive partnership relationship. You know, that's, it's, a, it's a temporary blip, yeah. So that's the way we should think about it. Okay, uh, neither, lastly, do you adapt to poverty. Poverty is like unemployment. You go down, you stay down. <laughs> Being poor, the fifth year of poverty is just as bad as the third year, which is just as bad as the first year. So it's, these have long-run effects. Indeed, in talking about long-run effects, some things matter to you even after they're finished. And we call this scarring from the labour economics literature. So unemployment is bad while you're unemployed, but it turns out that it's also bad after you've stopped being unemployed. What that means in statistical terms is that correlation I, I estimated between unemployment and life satisfaction is actually an underestimate of the total well-being loss from unemployment because it continues to be felt even after it's finished. So it's even worse than those numbers suggested. Uh, yeah, and we estimate that the effect of a past year of unemployment is about one-tenth of the effect of a current year of uh, unemployment. So, so large as you accumulate it over the years. Okay, the third part, and this is the use of the uh, birth cohorts here, is I can look at adult life satisfaction and trace that back to things that happen to you in your teens, during your primary school, or even beforehand. And th this is not just an intellectual curiosity. The reason we're interested in this is that we can intervene in a policy sense at all kinds of ages. We can imagine interventions on you. You're, you're, you're all adults, that's fine. We can do things to you via tax benefit social policy. But we can also intervene on your children when they're teenagers. We can also intervene on your children at primary school. And we can also intervene on the parents you are and then see how that traces through to the life satisfaction of the adults your children will become. So that, that, that's the whole life course uh, scale of well-being intervention that I think we need to consider. So you've seen this as well. Um, uh, this is, well, you have seen this, but this is actually the unstandardised effect. To give you an idea of the uh, correlation with adult life satisfaction on a 0 to 10 scale, that emotional health at age 16 is the largest predictor of um, adult life satisfaction on a 0 to 10 scale with a one standard deviation change in emotional health, giving you about 0.2. But again, it's 0.2 through all of your adult life. 
So it's 0.2 every year. Every year you get it. So it's an extra 0.2 um, on your score all the way through your adulthood, which is large. Qualifications, as Richard said, this is final. Uh, adult qualifications is in second place with childhood behaviour in third. All of these are significant. And note what I am not talking about here. I'm not talking about cost. This is benefit. Some of these things are very cheap to change. Some of them are incredibly expensive. Educating someone uh, to have a university education or beyond is actually quite expensive. OK, so those are the adolescent outcomes at age 16. We can also look at how those relate to the kind of family you had. And that will allow you to um, see how we can intervene on the family to affect the children, to affect the adults. And there are many, many, many numbers here. I'm only going to give you a very few. Um, family income matters. And we knew that. We, we knew this one. This is very well known. This is the intergenerational transmission uh, number whereby educated slash rich parents have educated slash rich kids. And that just works. And we find that here as well. So family incomes having the largest effect on uh, uh, childhood academic outcomes. Well, when we turn to mother's mental health, we're finding effects that are as large, slightly larger, but this time concentrated on emotional health and behaviour at age 16. And that's worth underlining because emotional health at age 16 is the strongest adolescent predictor of how your life is going to be throughout adulthood in terms of life satisfaction. And parental conflict is focused mainly on uh, uh, adolescent behaviour. And it's actually very interesting, parental conflict. We all think separation is what matters. You know, are your parents together or not? Tra -la -la. It's actually not that. If we introduce conflict, pre-existing conflict, into the analysis, separation makes no difference. It doesn't matter whether you're separated or not. What matters is whether, you're parental, whether your parents fought with each other. If you cross the two, you get this fantastic uh, sort of non-monotonic ranking. The best, you want to know, the best parents you should have had. Let me tell you what you're, the parents you should have had. Right? You should have had parents who didn't separate and who weren't in conflict. That's what you should have had. Okay, we didn't have that, right? So anyway, that's what you should have had. Followed by that, you should have had parents who separated, but who weren't in conflict. Then you should have had parents who separated and were in conflict. And the worst of all, parents who were in conflict but stayed together. And that's the worst possible combination you can have for your outcomes at age 16, therefore for your life satisfaction through adulthood. So there's many, many, many uh, variables we've analysed in this way. I can't go through all of them. Whoops. One thing we can do with, um, this is actually a third data set here, ALSPAC. One thing we can do is look at the effect of schools. Do schools matter? Hugely. They matter for, of course, academic outcomes, but you knew that but they matter for all outcomes just as importantly. The way we can identify this is that in the ALSPAC data, we have multiple children who go to the same school. So we can identify an average school effect on these kids when they're age 16. And this is showing you the effect on the child outcomes of a one standard deviation in school quality. So this is a large effect, and again, this is you, you get this at age 16, which feeds through to your life satisfaction through your entire life. So these, these are uh, large effects. Even more strikingly, in primary school, as you may remember, you only had one teacher. In secondary school, you have loads of different teachers, so it's muddier. In primary school, you have one teacher, Mrs. X, Mr. Y. Again, we have multiple children who were with Mr. X or Mrs. Y. We can identify the effect of Mrs. X, Mr. Y, throughout that child's life. These effects are equally extremely large. So not all schools are the same, that you knew. Within each school, not all teachers are the same, 
and these are very large effects and they last for a very long time. Lastly, there is such a thing as society, I want to tell you. Um, this society in which you live matters. Um, we can relate individual well-being to the characteristics of the country in which they live, the area in which they live. Richer countries are happier than poorer countries, that we knew already. And standard economic factors matter as well. I mean, I'm not here to surprise you by saying, gosh, unemployment's a bad thing and so is inflation. You're like, yeah, of course we knew that. But when we analyse this in terms of well-being, we can say exactly how much more important is one than the other. And it turns out that a point of unemployment is about twice as important in life satisfaction terms as a point of inflation. So perhaps we shouldn't have been so worried about inflation as we once were and more worried about uh, unemployment. And we can do the same kind of analysis with respect to environment and government quality. Um, and we have analysed the effect of crime on individual well-being. I, I showed this very briefly earlier. Most of the effect of crime doesn't go through the associated lower well-being of the criminal and his or her worse future prospects. Rather, it goes through the effect on individuals around you. And the effect on others is about three times as large as the effect on yourself. We can e also look at other kinds of social behaviour, such as generosity, volunteering, sociability and so on, and do a cross-country analysis. And we, of course, need to do this because um, you know, all the Danes are uh, exposed to the same level of Danish trust. So we need to compare the Danes to the Belgians, to the Finnish and so on, to see how important these country-level variables are. And when we do that, and these are numbers from John Helliwell, uh, from the Gallup World Poll, we find large numbers again and, and very significant. And you'll notice the effect of, for example, freedom, uh, social support and health across countries. These are the kind of countries in which we uh, wish to live. OK, so... I am out of time. I've, I've really just scratched the surface of the many, many, many things we can do in this literature, and I would argue to you the very many things we need to do, not only in this literature, but in a policy sense, to find out what happens as you change a policy and what happens to the life satisfaction and well-being of the individuals who are uh, affected by that policy. Um, there are many more details, and, and this is a piece of shameless advertising. Please buy a copy. Uh, please, please buy many copies. It um, should be out just about in time for Christmas, I believe. Um, <laughs> and if you would like a draft copy, uh, uh, that's Harriet's email address that I noticed. She has now modified, so it disappears off the bottom of the screen, and you, you can't write to her. And with that, I shall finish. Thank you very much. <laughs>